President, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. It's a very exciting day around here. Um, we'll have reaction. and then This is my video update from Larnica, Cyprus, on this Friday afternoon, June 30th. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with Nigel Farage and the video that he put out yesterday, where Farage explains that he is going to have to most likely leave the United Kingdom. He is going to have to move to another country. And the reason that uh, Farage is going to be forced to leave the United Kingdom is because his current bank has sent him a notice that they will be closing his bank account. And every other bank that he has approached to open up a new bank account has denied him service. They refuse to open up a bank account for Nigel Farage. Think about that for a sec. They refuse to open up a bank account for Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage was once uh, representing the, uh, the UK in the European Parliament. He once uh, headed up a very a very prominent and an important political party. He led the Brexit movement and the banking system is now refusing to, to deal with him. Now one of the reasons that uh, that allegedly is being uh, talked about for why the banks are refusing to do business with Nigel Farage is because he, uh, he led the Brexit movement. Another reason that's being cited is that uh, Nigel Farage, at one point in time, like four or five years ago, he had uh, a show with RT, I believe it was with RT UK, Russia Today UK. And uh, they're saying that because he had a show with Russian media, that's why he's being uh, canceled. And that's what's happening to Nigel Farage. He is being deplatformed, but offline, offline deplatformed. That's what they're doing to Nigel Farage, and they're doing all of this so that they can force Nigel Farage to leave the United Kingdom. This is an absolutely horrific and terrifying development that is taking place in the United Kingdom. And if they can do this to Nigel Farage, well, then they can do this to anybody. And uh, no doubt about it, the UK permanent states, they sent a memo out to all of the banks an order to all of the banks and they said if you have an account with Nigel Farage close it and if Nigel Farage knocks on your door to open up a new bank account refuse him that is exactly what happened an absolutely terrifying development but there you have it the totalitarian failed state of Britain. That's what we're seeing unfold. So that is what is going on with Nigel Farage. And uh, let's now talk about a failed leader, a failed EU leader, and that is Emmanuel Macron of France, because as France is, is on fire because of the protests, as buildings are being are being torched as businesses and commercial shops are being looted as all kinds of chaos is breaking out throughout all of France i believe that uh, le figaro yesterday they said that uh, there was a record number of arrests that took place in France yesterday as all of this is happening what does the French president do? Does he, uh, does he consult with his team and, and tries to figure out a negotiated, peaceful way out of this? Does he try to, to appeal to the French public, to appeal to the protesters for calm and for order? Nope, that's not what Emmanuel Macron does. What he does, what he did is that he went to an Elton John 
concerts. No joke. No joke. While all of this stuff is happening in France, while the entire country is, uh, is on fire, <laughs> the entire country is on fire because of, uh, of this event, this shooting of this, uh, I believe, like a 16 or 17-year-old teenager by the, uh, by the police. As all of this is happening in France, what does Macron do? He goes to see Elton John live. He goes to uh, to listen to to Rocket Man and I'm still standing and Candle in the Wind and whatever. He takes his wife with them and they go to an Elton John concert and everybody records Macron at the concert having a good time. His wife is dancing and and that was uh, Macron's response to the protests to go to see Elton John. And uh, today, from what I understand, today he was at some sort of European, uh, like an EU heads of state meeting. And he had to uh, leave the meeting because things were so out of control in France that he had to excuse himself from the meeting. And what does Macron do? He mobilizes something like 40,000 like riot police so that they can crack down on, on French citizens. What? What in... I'm not even going to say the word. I don't like to curse, and I'm not going to curse, but man, Macron is a... Ugh. Anyway, all right, so that is Macron. That is what's going on with Macron. And from Macron, we are now going to, to talk about a good leader, in my opinion. A great man, in my opinion. Perhaps the best foreign minister in the world, and that is Sergei Lavrov of the Russian Federation. And Mr. Lavrov, he was speaking to reporters, and he talked about the reaction to the Wagner mutiny. We are not obligated to explain anything to anyone, to give any assurances that Russia acts transparently, adding that both President Vladimir Putin and other senior officials have commented on the Wagner mutiny. If anyone in the West has any doubt, any doubts, well, that's your problem. Lavrov, Lavrov went on to say that Russia has always emerged stronger from the challenges it has had to overcome while describing the mutiny as nothing more than trouble. The same thing will happen now. Moreover, we feel that this process has already begun. So that was Lavrov's response to what seems to be the never-ending stories now from the collective West media about Wagner and Prigozhin, and now they're talking about Surovikin and uh, Yerasimov and how those guys have... Uh, have not made any media appearances. Not that Yerasimov and Surovikin were ever in the media. I mean, Surovikin, I think, had done one interview in like all of his his time at uh, as a as a commander in the Russian military. I think he's only done one televised. <laughs> I think he's done only one televised uh, interview. So, uh, I, I don't know, just, and, and Yadasimov, he, he was never on TV either, to be quite honest. He was, he was never the, the very talkative, uh, uh, the very talkative. Bioine, protapola, pes, hello world. Hello, hello world, Bess. Hello, hello. Bess and Ayasu. Okay. <laughs> okay. Alex Christoforo. Christoforo, Alex Christoforo. <laughs> Man. Uh, thank you. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, what was I saying? Yeah, Yadasimov was never that much on TV either. I mean, he never... I don't think I've ever seen an interview with Yadasimov, to be quite honest. But now the media is going crazy about Sudovikin is missing and uh, Yadasimov is, miss, is missing. I, I'm telling you, the Collective West, they are super good at narrative control because they took a narrative of Zaluzhny and Budanov, who really were missing... Two guys that loved to give interviews. I mean, they were giving interviews every day, three times a day. And they disappeared for four or five weeks. And they seem to have disappeared again. At least Budanov has. I'll talk about Zeluzhny in a bit. But, uh, but Yerasimov and, and, and Sudovikin never gave interviews. But the Western media, what they did is they took... They, they, they didn't report on the Zeluzhny budanov disappearance. And then they took the narrative of those guys legitimately disappearing and they shifted it to Sudovikin and Yerasimov. They are so freaking, <laughs> they really know, they really know how to control the media narrative. I'm telling you. Anyway, what was I saying? So Lavrov was, uh, was basically responding to, to the never ending stories about the, the Wagner affair. And basically he's just telling the collective West, uh, mind your business. <laughs> Mind your business is what he's telling them. He also said that Moscow has serious doubts about the sanity of many Western leaders. While publicly admitting that their citizens are suffering due to the Ukraine conflict, these leaders, on their policies in the name of helping Kiev prevail over Moscow, the foreign minister explained. Does this sound sane? Does this reflect national interests? That's a direct quote from Lavrov. Does that not sound like Macron? Is, is Lavrov not explaining the actions of the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who goes to see Elton John while his country suffers, while his country is, is in flames? <laughs> it is in flames. And he goes to see Elton John. That is exactly what Lavrov is saying in this statement. Western leaders are insane is what he's saying they're insane and they don't care about their people all they care about is getting more money and more weapons to ukraine because more money and more weapons to ukraine means more money in their pockets and for macron it probably means a promotion when uh when he can finally step down as being president of France, because Macron doesn't give a flying F about being president of France. I think that's obvious. We've been saying this on the Durand for a long, long time. Macron is completely disinterested in being president of France. He wants to be the, uh, the head of the, uh, of the UN or, or the, the head of the European Union. He wants Ursula's job. And maybe he can get it. Maybe Ursula can be shifted to, to NATO, and maybe he can take over at the European Union. Though, the reports are that uh, Stoltenberg, as far as NATO goes, is going to stay put. He's not going to go anywhere because the collective West, they cannot agree on, uh, on a suitable replacement. They're bickering and arguing amongst themselves about who to place as, uh, as who to put in as a replacement for Stoltenberg. And, and let me just show you some of the the articles that the Collective West is, uh, is putting out there with, uh, with regards to the, the wagner Prigozhin affair. Look at The Economist's cover. The humbling of Vladimir Putin. It has Putin in cracks, right? Because Putin is crumbling. The, uh, the Russian government is cracking. That is from The Economist. And then you have this publication, Le Obs, which, uh, which talks about the fissures in the Putin government, the cracks, once again, the cracks in, in, uh, in the Kremlin. Can you see the, the narrative? They've all been prepped. They've all been given the script about the narrative over the, the Wagner uh, mutiny. And then, of course, you have the Moscow Times article, which has nothing to do with Moscow, which has the title, Sources in the Ministry of Defense Report the Arrest of Sudovikin, from the Moscow Times, which, which was uh, owned by a company in Finland. Now they're, they're based in the Netherlands, and, and they're running all of their, their propaganda from the Netherlands. And 
people see a title like Sudovican has been fired and uh, and it has uh, it ha it's coming from the Moscow Times and they say oh my god the Moscow Times is saying Sudovican has been fired or he's in prison and then the New York Times run runs with it and the Washington Post and the Guardian and and now you have this whole Sudovican thing and it's, it's nonsense in my opinion it's nonsense I actually think his daughter came out with a statement and she said something like uh, he's he's on, on the front lines i mean <laughs> he's doing his job he's working anyway uh let's see bloomberg though bloomberg did have an article with the title wagner's exit from ukraine won't radically alter the war's course at twenty-five thousand groups combat numbers possibly overestimated and wagner impacted a small part of the front and had largely disengaged so a bit of of truth from from bloomberg and talking about zeluzhny zeluzhny or someone who claims to be zeluzhny <laughs> he gave an interview to the washington post and let me read you what zeluzhny said because i think here you'll also see how how the narrative is uh is scripted and prepared for the entire uh, Alensky regime, including the military, especially when they speak with collective West media. So here's a part of uh, Zeluzhny's interview with the Washington Post. So it pisses me off, Zeluzhny said, when he hears that Ukraine's long-awaited counteroffensive in the country's east and south has started slower than expected, an opinion publicly expressed by Western officials and military analysts and also by President Alensky. Though Zeluzhny was not referring to Alensky, his troops have gained some ground, even if it's just 500 meters every day, he said. Uh, this is the important line from Zeluzhny. This is not a show, Zeluzhny said Wednesday in his office at Ukraine's general staff headquarters. It's not a show the whole world is watching and betting on or anything. Every day, every meter is given by blood, end quote. So, Alensky, about a week ago, in an interview, I believe it was with the BBC, what did Alensky say? He said, this is not some sort of Hollywood movie. And then Budanov, the, uh, was it Budanov? No, I think it was Podoliak. Podoliak, Alensky's BFF. He said a few days ago, this is not some Netflix show that you're watching here. Once again, always with the, with the narrative that Ukraine's counteroffensive was never meant to be fast. It's going to be slow moving. We're gaining uh, some grounds and some villages every day. We're chipping away. That's the narrative, right? There was never going to be a quick strike to the Sea of Azov and splitting up the Russian forces and, uh, and splitting up the, uh, the land bridge and the supply lines. That was never the, the real goal of this counteroffensive. The narrative is uh, this is going to be a very, very slow affair very very slow inch by inch meter by meter it's going to go very slowly and and delensky this is not a hollywood movie budanov this is not a netflix show and zeluzhny this is not a show they're all reading from the same script so the biden white house Biden White House, it looks like they are going to hand over cluster munitions to Ukraine. A terrible idea. It's going to cause a lot, of, a lot of suffering. Cluster munitions. I believe that cluster munitions are illegal as well, but that hasn't stopped the Biden White House or the UK from, uh, from giving uh, depleted uranium. So it looks like they're going to give cluster munitions. And according to the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. is considering attack arms, long-range missiles, to bolster U Ukraine's fight. Officials see new urgency after long reluctance to provide advanced missile system. Why do they see new urgency? Why do the, do, does, does the Biden White House see a new urgency? Well, because Ukraine is losing and they're losing very, very bad. And the counteroffensive is going very, very poorly. It was meant to be a quick strike. It has not turned into a quick strike. They're trying to reshape the narrative and they're trying to say it's going to be slow now and uh, Ukraine is making progress and they're gaining a little house here and a little dacha there. 
But we all know the truth. We all know the truth that things are going very badly. The, uh, the U.S., the collective West, they're having to, to give Ukraine more Bradleys. They're thinking of ways to give Ukraine more tanks because of, uh, of the loss of all of the previous Bradleys and tanks that they gave them for this quick strike counteroffensive. It's looking very, very bad. The reports are that Ukraine has lost in this first uh, wave of the counteroffensive. The reports are that Ukraine has lost anywhere between 13,000 to 20,000 uh, soldiers in this first strike, depending on, on, uh, on where you go to get the, the information. An absolute catastrophe, especially if you consider that, uh, that Ukraine had something around 50, maybe 60,000 tops uh, troops prepared for this counteroffensive. And they've already lost, let's just say, 13,000. Let's go at the low end. 13,000 is already out of, say, and I'll even give, give Ukraine the benefit of the doubt. I'll say 60,000 soldiers for this counteroffensive. And you take out 13,000, and they still haven't reached the front line of defense for Russia. A catastrophe. An absolute catastrophe. And they are trying to push in the direction of Bakhmut. There's, uh, there is talk that they're going to renew uh, a big push in the Zaporozhye direction. Once again, uh, they're looking at the ZNPP. They're looking at Kherson. But it looks like now the big direction is Bakhmut. It looks like Ukraine feels like that's where the Russians may have their weakest fortifications in Bakhmut. Because, well, the Russian military hasn't really had time to build up defensive lines in Bakhmut. Most of the defensive lines are behind Bakhmut. Uh, significant defensive lines are behind Bakhmut. But Bakhmut, the Russians haven't really had time to prepare defenses. So it looks like Ukraine is trying to perhaps do something there so that they can make some progress before the NATO meeting in Vilnius. But Forbes, Forbes had an article admitting to the catastrophe of this counteroffensive. The title of the Forbes article is 25 tanks and fighting vehicles gone in a blink. The Ukrainian defeat near Mala Tokmachka was worse than we thought. It was worse than we thought. That is quite an admission from, uh, from Forbes. So the attack comes. The cluster munitions and the attackums. I'm going to put up a map right now, and you're going to see the uh, the range, the possible, let's say the possible range of uh, of the attackum missiles. And in this map, you can see that the possible range, the possible effective range of the attackums, absolutely covers uh, Russian territory, including Crimea. So. Blinken and Kirby, they're going to come out with statements when the attackums are approved and are on their way to Ukraine. They may, have, they may already even be in uh, Ukraine. When they give out their statements, you know what Blinken and Kirby are going to say. They are going to say, we have decided, the Biden White House has decided to provide Kiev with attackums long-range missiles, but, but they're going to say this is in no way an escalation. This doesn't mean that we're a party to the war. They're going to say that. And they're going to say, we have received guarantees, promises, written. Written and signed guarantees and promises from the Alensky regime that these attack on missiles will in no way be used to strike Russian territory. That is exactly what Kirby and Blinken are going to say. Always keep in mind, whenever they do say Russian territory... For the collective West, that means that Crimea is not considered Russian territory. And so the Alensky regime using the attack arms to hit Crimea for them means that they're not hitting Russian territory. So for them, Crimea is absolutely on the table. But the Alensky regime, when they get these attack arms, they're going to use them, yes, to strike at Crimea. And they're going to use the attack arms to strike deep into Russian territory. And this brings me to the warnings that Russia has issued the collective West. Warnings which have also come with action. Sergei Shoigu, about a week, a week and a half ago, Alexander covered this on his channel. We covered this on the Duran. I talked about this a bit on a video I did a couple of, uh, of days ago. 
Shoigu, he, uh, he put out a statement. This is about a, maybe about a week, a week and a half ago. And he warned the U.S. and the U.K. that if they continue to escalate, if they hit Russian territory, Russia knows where all of the decision-making centers are in Ukraine and possibly outside of Ukraine. And, uh, and Russia is going to destroy those decision-making centers. And they already have destroyed one. This was about a week and a half ago. And uh, Sh uh, Shoigu came out with his message when they destroyed this, this decision-making center. He came out, he gave his warning. He said, we already destroyed one decision-making cent decision center. There were NATO commanders there. Stop escalating. Stop attacking Russian territory. And then, uh, and then you had the, uh, the Prigozhin-Wagner incident. And then you had the Russians hitting at Kramatorsk and... The Russian Ministry of Defense, they have actually put out a statement on the missile strike in Kramatorsk on the 27th of June. And they have said that that uh, missile strike at this hotel slash pizzeria, because I believe the pizzeria was part of the hotel. And this hotel actually was closed off to, to guests. It was only uh, mercenaries and soldiers and commanders that could stay at this hotel. At least that's, that's the information that I've that I've received about this hotel. Anyway, the Russian Ministry of Defense said that they took out two uh, Ukraine generals, up to 50 officers and up to 20 foreign mercenaries and advisors. So my whole point in all of this is that uh, if and when Ukraine gets these attackums and if and when Ukraine decides to strike at Russian territory, expect the Russians this time around to take out another decision-making center inside of Ukraine. And eventually Ukraine's going to run out of decision-making centers with US, UK, Collective West commanders at these decision-making centers. They're gonna run out of these decision-making centers and uh, Russia's gonna start looking at decision-making centers, perhaps Russia's gonna start looking at decision-making centers outside of Ukraine if the Collective West continues to escalate we are we are on a terrifying trajectory an absolutely terrifying trajectory and even jungle joseph he came out with a statement the other day and he said that the eu is thinking of turning the european peace fund into the defense fund of ukraine now i did a video on video in athens a couple of months ago where jungle joseph was talking about transforming the entire european union into a wartime economy. Well, this is, this is Jungle Joseph trying to inch towards that. I'm not saying they're going to, tr to transform the EU member states into, into wartime footing. I don't think that's, that's possible, but this is Jungle Joseph's way of trying to figure out ways to take the EU money that comes from EU member states and comes from EU taxpayers to take that money and to put into funds that, uh, that are going to be directed to the Alensky regime and to fighting this conflict with Russia. And all pretenses of some sort of uh, peace fund, the EU having some sort of peace fund so that they can promote peace, well, that's nonsense. The, even, even Jungle Joseph is done pretending. He's done pretending that there's some sort of peace fund it's time to call this thing what, what it is, which is a defense fund. And that's what they're going to call this. Actually, I think they should probably call it a proxy war fund. But anyway, so that's from uh, Jungle Joseph. And uh, let's do some clown worlds now. And clown world number one was Mike Pence, presidential hope for who has presidential hopeful, who has absolutely zero chance to become president of the United States. Mike Pence, he visited Kiev, and Pence said that there are going to be no American troops in uh, Ukraine, fighting in Ukraine, no boots on the ground. But, but Mike Pence, being the good neocon that he is, he said that the U.S. should, should give uh, Ukraine all the money and all the weapons they need so that they can continue to fight Russia. What a great guy, that Pence, huh? until the last Ukrainian. So that's Mike Pence, that's his trip to, to Kiev. And we had another trip to Kiev and that is 
Greta Thunberg. How am I doing on time here? All right, I've got a couple of minutes. So we had Greta Thunberg. She visited Alensky in, uh, in Ukraine, and they're putting together like some sort of working group so that they could figure out the environmental damage from Russia's invasion, according to Thunberg and to Alensky. Alensky told Thunberg, and I quote, we need your professional help. We need the activists. He thanked them for the compact of very con concretic, that's what he said, con concretic steps. That's a direct quote. That sends a very important signal of supporting Ukraine. So it was Thunberg and a bunch of activists, by the way. And then Thunberg accused Russia of deliberately targeting the environment and people's livelihoods and homes, and therefore also destroying lives, because this is, after all, a matter of people. According to the Associated Press, the proposed working group wants to evaluate the environmental damage from the conflict, start efforts to restore Ukraine's ecology, and formulate mechanisms to hold Russia accountable. <laughs> Thunberg is there to do all of these things. Greta Thunberg. She didn't really care that much about Nord Stream, did she? Nope. Depleted uranium? Nah, she doesn't care about depleted uranium from the US and the UK. Cluster munitions? No, Thunberg doesn't care about cluster munitions. Nah, she, she cares about the environmental damage that the Russians are causing. <laughs> oh boy. So, so then Alensky, after thanking Thunberg for her activism and, and wrapping up this working group meeting, the first working group meeting to hold Russia accountable for the environmental damage, which is just another way, when you think about it, it's just another way for them to justify more money to Ukraine, right? Russia damaged this and Russia damaged that, so we need some more funds from the European Defense Fund and uh, more money which goes into their pocket, right? So that's, that's, that's what this is really all about. Just trying to find more things to, to place on the bill, uh, uh, on the tab of, uh, of Collective West taxpayers, which is really what we're talking about because Russia is not going to pay for any of this. Collective West taxpayers are going to pay for all of this, whether Ukraine exists or doesn't exist. The Western taxpayer, they're on the hook for all of this. And uh, all of these, these globalists, they're going to get paid very, very nicely for uh, the work that they're doing in Ukraine. But anyway, uh, Lensky wrapped up the, the meeting and uh, then he then he thanked uh, Greta. He said, Greta, uh, thank you very much for coming to Kiev and for uh, agreeing to to do this uh, environmental work for us. Um, Greta, before you go, before you leave, uh, maybe maybe you have maybe a billion dollars you give me so I can buy Green, green environmental home in uh, in Sweden, in Stockholm. Yeah, good. Give me some money. I buy home. It be very green. You happy? I'm happy. Europe happy. <laughs> so that's how Alensky, uh sent off Greta Thunberg to to return back to her to her offices in in Brussels or wherever she she operates from, wherever she's puppeteered from uh, let's now do a final clown world oh boy a lot of clown worlds today and this one comes from bono <laughs> that's right you two front man bono he has designed a t-shirt as well as uh as a print this is bono's design by the way because bono's an artist he has designed this print and this t-shirt with Alensky's image on it, and he calls it the Freedom and Fear T-shirt and screen print. The Freedom and Fear yellow tee, the Freedom and Fear black tee, the Freedom and Fear hoodie, black hoodie. The hoodie goes for 90 euros, the T-shirt goes for 45 euros, and the screen print goes for 50 euros. And this money is going to be donated to Alensky's United 24 charity which is the charity where mark hamill luke skywalker also does his work his uh, drone work and the money he raises goes to united 24 and united 24 was the charity that collected the crypto payments 
and I believe they were working also with I believe they were working with Sam Bankman Freed. And so you see what's going on here, right? We, I don't need to explain it. Bono, what happened to you, Bono? What happened to you? What happened to the U2 of, uh, of, of Boy in October, War, the Unforgettable Fire, the Joshua Tree? What happened to that U2? What happened to these guys? What a tragedy. The downfall of U2, the downfall of a once great rock band, turned globalist shills. All right, that's the video, everybody, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Rockfin, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. And speaking about merchandise, why, why pay 90 euros from, for an Alensky hoodie when you can get a Duran t-shirt for much, much less, and it's much, much nicer? Or a Duran hat. I am signing off, everybody, from Larnica Cyprus. Also, go to Twitter, the Duran underscore shorts. We're putting up uh, one minute shorts from our videos on Twitter. Search for it, you'll find it. Follow us there. Take care. <laughs>